Hello and welcome to Genius Tea Time. Hey, thank you, Heather, for doing this. This is really awesome. My pleasure. Hey, so uh, description purposes, I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with brown hair in front of a full bookshelf, and I am going to introduce Heather in her own words. Heather Woodbury is a writer performer known for stage serials that combine the immediacy of solo performance with the scope of a novel. Critically praised in New York Times, Chicago Sun-Times, and featured on Ira Glass's This American Life, her works take the pulse of people's lives in the crosshairs of history. In addition to numerous stage productions in the USA and Europe, they are published as novels and podcast as radio plays. In 2020, 91 performing artists from 17 cities performed her 12-part serial As the Globe Warms on Zoom, rating donations for a dozen pandemic relief efforts. She's a recipient of ENEA, Kennedy, Obie, Cola, and Spalding Gray Awards for playwriting and performing. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Again. Do you want to tell us about Swing Left, which is the organization that we're going to be um, supporting with this? Yeah, so um, uh, a year ago, I was about to set off on a journey across the country to do a campaign in five uh, key swing states in, and in the midterms. And I got in touch with um, a couple of different organizations um, one of them swing left and they got right back to me, this really great guy, Matt, um, got back to me and he said, I'm a railroad nut too. And he hooked me up with all of these amazing grassroots organizers across the country, places to stay, um, people who, who could focus in on exactly what, um, was the best campaign for me to spend my time campaigning in. Um, so as to get the most bang for my canvassing buck. Um, in other words, campaigns that were close in that locality and that would also elect the, the bigger federal offices at the same time. Anyway, so um, Swing Left is kind of like almost the sponsor of this project, Whistle Stop Swing, that I'm about to tell you about. And um, one thing that they were doing during the campaign is they, they look at all the campaigns across the country and they figure out who is the closest to, to winning if they just get a little bit more money. And so you give money to that one fund and then they apply it you know, very strategically. So, um, and also of course they're devoted to getting the most progressive candidates elected across the United States. So we like them. Um, and so please give money to them. I know this is a week also to give money to Doctors Without Borders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and of course, Laura's wonderful opulent mobility. Thank you. Thank Laura, you so much. <laughs> but share with us your whistles, your whistle stop swing. I love that you did this. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, so like I was saying, uh, about a year, about, you know, the end of October, middle of October, I was setting off from New York City, where I had already been canvassing for Congressman, uh, Congressman Max Rose. Um, and um, I set off and I did five swing states on the train on Amtrak. Um, and I'm going to give you a little taste of it. I'm going to, I'm going to read, read, read for you and show you some pictures. Um, so um, I basically, I went from New York to Philadelphia, um, then I went and did Pittsburgh, then I went to Toledo, which I'm going to share with you. I had never been to Toledo, Ohio. I didn't know anybody there. So that turned out to be a surprise, wonderful part of my trip. Then I went to La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, then my brother and I met up in, in Minneapolis and we made this sort of family pilgrimage to uh, Woodlake, Wisconsin, where my mother and her her brother, my uncle, had been taken in by this Swedish farm family uh, back when her parents, who were investigative journalists, were, were having a lot of problems in the Twin Cities. Ultimately, my grandfather, an investigative journalist in the 1930s, was assassinated in the Twin Cities. And so my brother and I made this kind of heartland journey to my mother's, what she called the home for her soul, and left her ashes there. Uh, in the lake, some of her ashes. And then we continued, I continued on to Texas. And then I ended in Arizona um, right before and on election day. And then I came back to LA. So wow. without further ado, I'm gonna just tell you, read you part of the travel log. So the travel log was called Whistle Stop Swing. It's on Substack. 
on my Substack Heather Woodbury's Periodic Fable, and you can find it there. And there's also audio interviews that I recorded with people and photographs. Um, let me just share the screen with you so that you can see some of these pictures. Okay. <clears throat> Whistle Stop Swing, October 25th, dispatch number five. A tale of two Toledos. Actually, maybe four Toledos, but I'm a sucker for alliteration. So, seedy, scenic, central, and suburban. Day one, Toledo arrival, Tuesday, 5.35 a.m. Oh, you want the city bus, says the ag Amtrak agent behind the plexiglass. She is affable, round-cheeked, brown-haired. You need to walk up the hill, and it's around the Circle K gas station, just up around there. The night train from Pittsburgh barreling its way to Chicago, deposits me and a handful of others, a Dayton housewife, some Amish folk, other plain type people of assorted ethnicities in a small, valiantly art deco train station, curving vinyl benches worn at the seams, displays of model trains, nostalgia photos of the railroad's glory days, and a handwritten sign that reads, defend train service. All the others go off in cars or board an Amtrak bus to carry them to points more obscure. For some reason, I do not want an Uber. It feels creepy. And so I trudge up to scope out and then pull my bags back down to the station a couple of times. I chicken out on walking to the bus stop because although there are some perfectly respectable, humble houses off of this deserted paved circle of MLK Junior Plaza, there's also this stretch of warehouses and a vine bordered sidewalk that looks murky. It's still dark out, mind you. So I pull myself up the hill and the third time out, I summon my nerve and I hit that stretch. And it turns out not so bad. There's actually a big house and lawn and kids' toys, cars, right beyond the overgrown vines. I make it to the Circle K convenience store and gas station at the convergence of two industrial boulevards. I wait in a gritty, not cold wind and notice two white men, possibly a father and son, who sit heads down by the store's entrance. Latino immigrants in pickups whiz by on their way to work. On the bus are more blue collar people on their way to work, plus a couple of white street people. It costs $1.50 and the bearded pasty faced bus driver takes his time before he helps me get my uncooperative dollar bill in the feeder. Oh yeah, I, oh, I seem to be having problems. Straighten it out. I, I don't know. Oh God, God, we're holding up the whole bus here. Oh, oh thank you. Scenic. Four stops later, I am in the built up downtown. I find a brightly lit place called City Egg, which borders a new medical complex located on a terraced waterfront promenade on the Maumee River. City Egg offers decent coffee, avocado toast, and a blessedly pristine restroom. After 20, after all night on the train, I avail myself. The egg is operated by a lone young woman, calm, methodical, brown hair pulled back, a soft moon face without makeup. When I tell her it's my first time in Toledo, she and a sweet middle-aged early morning regular sporting a cheerful shade of lipstick, both welcome me. Seems to me that there's nothing to do here, but I'm sure if you're from someone there, somewhere else, says the counter woman. The river is pretty, I say, because the sun has now come up and I can catch a glimpse. This counter woman gives me a shy smile, a, sl a sly, excuse me. The counter woman gives me a sly smile. 
The lady customer grins kindly. Have a nice vacation here, she says. I walk to the river. I write in my journal. The sun is rising over the Maumee and I sit feet up on the cement dock in a red city supplied lawn chair facing the Eastern sh shore. Gulls circle, the river is wide and glassy, puckered with the slightest breeze. It is another warm day here on the lip of the Midwest. Later, from a posh hotel lobby, I continue. Gorgeous early morning on the water with swans a swim. I saw an old multi-arched bridge designed for admitting vessels and yellow leaves falling sideways to the riverbank. And gleefully, oh good, I've gone to the luxury hotel bathroom, left all the rest here with the nice hostess without paying a dime, wheeled my luggage, switched tops, put deodorant, did hair and makeup, pink lipstick and jackets feel very toledo ohio i then reported to the tim ryan office down the street for canvassing duty a tale of two make that four toledo's continued so we had cd and scenic now we've got central field organizer m long black hair with dynamite bangs drives me to my turf in central Toledo. I'll knock 40 doors on my own and then she'll come back and pick me up. The campaign I'm supporting is called Workers First and M fills me in on the day's mission as she navigates the freeway. Okay, the one early voting location in all of Toledo has been switched from downtown, accessible to those in central and other inner city neighborhoods, to a location high up in the suburban hills on Sylvania Avenue near Franklin Park Mall. I was to tell people to get out there and bank their vote early if they possibly could make it out there. Another obstacle to clear was that the mail-in ballots, which many elderly people had favor, had been getting sent back for not having enough postage. So make sure to tell them to put two stamps on it, a dollar's worth, one old woman voter would inform me, and to mail it right away. And better yet, just persuade them to go vote in person, just to be sure. This led to the third impediment to be aware of. Polling locations had been switched so that the place people have been used to voting for years is no longer the place. Make sure to check that their polling place is on the app and tell them, check it on the app, M told me. M is a student at UT, that means University of Toledo, and advocates strongly for people her age staying in Ohio and in Toledo. That's why she's involved in this Workers First campaign. She wants to make her region a place where people are doing well and desire to remain. I ask about the main industries of Toledo, having gleaned from historic plaques down by the Maumee River, that it was once a teeming port for travelers and the shipment of coal and farm goods. She tells me it is still farming. Corn, I ask? Yes, corn, she says. But soy? Oh, I say, right, soy. I think, right, soy-fed livestock. And the medical industry, she tells me, that's growing. I tell her I noted the big new ProMedica building on the waterfront. M drops me on Tecumseh Street in the middle of the small grid of blocks that I will walk with names such as Buckingham, Hamilton, Junction, and Nebraska, evoking a motley crew of associations. Old England, Old England founding father, turn of the century infrastructure, and the Great Plains but Tecumseh is something special. Shawnee leader, orator, warrior, who resisted the USA's land grab of his native Ohio. What the War of 1812 was really about, I've recently learned from combing around Ontario backcountry with my Canadian husband and getting their view of it. Resting Indian held lands protected by British treaty away from tribes 
allied with Canada. Tecumseh, with his pan-Indigenous visioning brother, founded Prophetstown, that's prophet with a P-R-O-P-H-E-T, not F. And from there, he sought to unify Indian nations into a single resistant confederacy. Now there's a C word I can get behind and win back Ohio. Allied with the Brits, he was killed in the War of 1812 and both Prophetstown and Ohio were lost to his people forever. Tecumseh Street is poorly paved with humps of cement creating cracks and potholes, grass and weeds, brambles and trees of many varieties and colors grow freely along its sidewalk and in empty stretches of yard. The houses that line it are mainly humble, white, traditional, clappered or vinyl sided, often with a single front facing gable under a reddish or green tar shingled roof and looking out over a, per a porch. Almost everyone has a front and a back porch. The fronts are either enclosed with screens or plastic or glass panels or open classic front porches or sometimes decks. Come on up and sit down here, a young 83 year old man tells me. Lightly bearded, open button shirt with some sort of medical related gear hanging around his neck, skin like smooth worn leather. Thank you, darling, I say. That sun was hitting you right in your eyes, he said. I know, I said. It's gotten hot. Yes, it has. You're hardly wearing a thing. True that. In walking Tecumseh, I'd had to peel off both of my pink jacket layers, donned gleefully that morning in the posh downtown hotel's luxury restroom. And now I was down to my sleeveless, body-hugging blue top over jeans and my prominent sparkling crucifix necklace, the American Express gold card of my canvassing uniform. We sat in his comfortable leaning back metal chairs and talked. He told me that he used to always volunteer at the polls, but that now he was done. He would, however, vote the Democratic slate that I handed off to him. All the crucial Ohio Supreme Court judges, state representatives for Ohio legislature, and Representative Marcy Kaptur, whose normally safe U.S. House seat was in play due to redrawn district lines. And of course, Tim Ryan for Senate. I imparted the information M had primed me with, and he pulled back his head and said, now, why would they do that about the early vote site relocation? Hmm, I wonder, I said. He was glad of the information and said he'd spread the word. As he saw me off down the steps, I said, God bless you. God bless you too, he said. And we meant it. I continued climbing the steps to the porches often painted black and hot pink, I noticed. I passed through bright planted flower beds and one laden apple tree, its many fruits decomposing in the grass. An older man there said, someone used to come and take them away for him, for cider, applesauce, but no more. And he couldn't handle all these apples nowadays. Most places, when people were home, they were elderly and would invite me up on the porch. I sat with more than one older person who told me of their own or their sick spouse's medical problems. I told each one that I would pray for them, and they thanked me. In particular, I recall one pale, lightly mustached, frail old woman in a purple top whose daughter would maybe drive her to the Franklin Park Mall. She had an eye operation and a COVID test coming up, but she was going to vote. I noted her information down and suggested the campaign get some help to her. 
close your eyes for a moment with me and wish the power of well-being to each of these gracious souls whom I encountered. Thank you. As I've noted, the last door is often the one that makes a difference. Nebraska, a more commercial and gritty avenue, was where I came upon my final porch of elderly people. A neighbor couple visiting an older woman and all of them voting. The wife of the couple had a beautiful to me face. Her skin was, was the color of onyx and her eyes and look were from another era, like a farm woman. But this often seems the case in the Midwest. The USA has so many different people and regions. I am continually reminded whenever I take a cross country trip such as this. She was an adamant constituent of Marcy Captor and talked about how well Marcy had represented them for many years. I asked them where the young person on my list might be. Let's call him Desmond. Oh, Desmond, he's right over there in the car. I walked over to the young man sitting in a parked SUV in the driveway. Good looking, leather coat, trimmed facial hair. He looked up from his phone and engaged me. I've been thinking, oh, believe me, he said, I've been thinking and I've been reading. After we got done with his absurd argument that females should only be permitted one exemption from outlawed abortion, since males were not exempted from supporting children they'd not chosen to give birth to, we moved on to the economy. He said that all politicians were liars and did nothing to improve his community's lives. I rattled off all the material improvements to Toledo lives that the Inflation Reduction Act provides and how 100% of Republicans had voted against it. The Inflation Reduction Act, he said, incredulous. Yeah, you like to read, Google it. Finally, I got pissed off, not at him, but at the red states. I told him not voting was a vote for them to keep control of our lives. I'm a 16th generation American, I said, probably he is too, and I know white people. I warned him that the civil rights of women and black people, such as they are, will be stripped further away by giving the red state whites full power. I saw something soften in his face. It was time to leave. I said it was great talking to him. Yes, it was, he said, the Inflation Reduction Act. And then Desmond, gave me an earnest young man smile. On a bench in front of the local community center at the corner of Junction and Tecumseh, I sat and rested from knocking 40 doors and waited for my ride. A stick thin older man, clothes covered in paint came walking past. Oh, Lord of my bones tired. Oh, he said. I second that emotion, I said. My feet are sore. He sat to rest beside me and asked what I'd been out here doing. We talked politics a while and also painting because my husband too is a house painter. So we talk who'd painted their own house, who needed to patch their roof better and get the vinyl siding up before winter. He'd just come from a job for an old African immigrant lady. He'd undercharged her because she needed the work done and didn't speak English very well. When I told him about the early voting at the mall, he suggested a bus ought to be arranged on Sunday and everyone come get on it and go vote. Back at the downtown HQ, I relayed his suggestion. We are doing just that, said D, the young black field organizer. Great minds think alike, I said. I hoisted my backpack, wheeled away my luggage and wished them great good luck on November 8th. I made for the bus stop to catch my bus to the suburbs of Toledo. And then I'm not gonna share with you the suburbs, um, except to say that if you go to my Substack, you can listen to my audio debate with MAGA Republicans in a parking lot. And um, also an interview with um, a woman who won, uh, Erica White. Um, and I actually canvassed with her and met her um, and she won for Ohio State Assembly. Um, okay.
So uh, I'm going to stop sharing right now. And I'm going to go to the next bit of the trip. So the next thing that I did was, um, I like I was telling everybody, I went to, uh, hold on, let me just get this technically ready to go. I went to, uh, I, I, I got on the, I went to, I'm sorry, I, I went to Minneapolis and, and did this pilgrimage with my brother to Woodlake, Wisconsin. And then um, after that, I had to double back to Chicago because that's how the train lines are. Um, sorry, I went to La Crosse, Wisconsin before that. And then I went down to Austin where I campaigned for Beto. That was my Hail Mary pass. And, um, and then I got on uh, the train, the su Sunset Limited essentially it, to, uh, to my last stop, which was going to be Phoenix. Okay, so um, this is about that. Arizona rival and Texas train ride in the belly of the beast. Last night, just before Tucson, the dude sitting behind me, drooping mutton chops, sloping belly, a long horn cap, jacket, t-shirt, jeans, 60s, insisted on standing in the aisle and talking to me. He looked at me portentously as if something was up, but I didn't know what. I was just jonesing to read my Poke Rafferty thriller street music and get off in Maricopa, Arizona after Tucson, take the cab I'd phoned ahead for with the local Jay's Rides, and go collapse at the Inn by Wyndham Corp after 28 hours on the train from Austin. But no, this dude stood there looking at me, whites of his gray eyes shining in the train car rack lights, and then sat down beside me and asked if it was all right. It wasn't, but I'd been social on this raucous, loquacious Texas Eagle, then rehooked in San Antonio to Sunset Limited ride, and I didn't want to be rude. He was a piano tuner and a musician. He liked the old songs, and he thought this was maybe why they fired him from the elder homes. The 421 San Antonio to Los Angeles seemed to be full of liquored up old white men some of whom had been handsome and charming once, and none of whom admitted that they probably were not any longer. They got progressively soused as the train spread, sped, and crawled across the endless scrubbed and mesquited beauty of West Texas. Mexican mountain ranges, ranges bit of an idiotic running fence dwarfed by the landscape, but nonetheless marring it. And then came the veritable enchantments of New Mexico, peaks and buttes and a glory bound caramel flan sunset over the indescribable flowing brows, noses and elbows of rim rock reflected as fire in temporary lakes formed by a high desert flash flood. Among the passengers was also a florid blonde MAGA lady with American flag insignia blouse leading a loud card game and saying shit like, this year they passed a law against dead people voting. There were black men and women, young or old, keeping their cool, having a laugh. There was a handful of friends that I made, interesting, alive, adventuring people. And you can hear snippets of conversations that I recorded in the cafe car. Um, and there was a smattering of euros and kiwis witnessing it all and sometimes offering comment. An older New Zealand gentleman wearing a t-shirt that featured botanical illustrations came up and thanked me for a loud conversation I'd had on the observation deck with a kind elderly Austinite about child separation policy. It's early Nazi behavior, taking children away from their parents, that's early Nazi behavior. Oh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. Of course, mutton chops bound for Tucson turned out to believe that Fauci was a criminal who should be executed, refused to acknowledge that way over a million Americans had died from COVID. And our conversation ended with me saying, well, I'll pray for you. 
I'll pray that what you say is true because then all of the doctors and nurses would not be dead, but they are, and believing won't bring them back to life. God bless, and him saying, from behind me where he'd returned to his own seat, they're destroying this country. Rand Paul knows a lot. And me saying, God bless, I'll pray for you to have compassion and be enlightened, God bless. And him muttering, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And me thinking, really? What good intentions are those? I haven't seen any on the road to hell. You and your antichrist are taking us all down. As I write this in the La Quinta by Wyndham Lobby, they are broadcasting Fox on a widescreen TV. Note to self, tell Jay, who I met in Pittsburgh, to add corporations who publicly air Fox to her Stop Fox Disinfo protest org activities. Yes, we are in Beast Belly, Arizona, as my cousin in Austin coined it when he dropped me off at the train station two nights ago. It is the day before the election. I have slept and drank hotel coffee, witnessed grackles strutting cutely past sculpted balls of bush in the gravel and mesquite parking lot. I've met Jay, nice looking black man, 50s, from Detroit, my driver, who came to visit and then moved here to be with his grown son. I've smelled the manure on the desert night wind, which Jay explained was from the nearby dairy farm. And soon I'll go volunteer for the embattled congressional member, Tom O'Halloran. Jay will drive me. All right, and then the last one is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, actually election night, the very last canvas that I did in Arizona. Uh, okay. And okay. Sundown at Indian School Road Apartments. Last get out the vote, last ride. We had split up and crunched the gravel paths, searching for voters who would open their thin steel brick red doors at dinner time, and maybe long shot be persuaded to run over to one of two equidistant schools and go vote for the democratic ticket. There are too many schools in Phoenix, Bill said to me earlier. Everywhere you look, here's a school, there's a school, all these charter schools. We just need one public school. Why do we need all these other schools? And you can listen to more of Bill, um, who was a native of Phoenix on Substack. Mostly we saw children playing, clusters of black kids near one building, clusters of Latino kids around another. And we saw parents getting home, leading kids by the hand, black, Latino, and a smattering of whites all working class. It was a textbook, low propensity voter site. There were some faintly promising conversations with Spanish speaking moms and abuelas, brothers and dads about registered citizen family members who might make it home from work in time to vote. And there were two young men who gave me hope. Neither were registered. The first I found sitting in the dark back of the building he had a brother, Cesar, who was registered and whom he expected home momentarily. I asked him why he himself wasn't registered and he said he didn't know much about politics. I told him about Ruben Gallego, what a good representative he was and how Adrian Fontes would protect their rights to vote and be counted. He didn't know that he could not just vote online, but he was enthusiastic I explained how he could register and how voting worked. Next time, I said, crossing the gravel towards the front of the buildings. Yeah, I will, he said. Yeah, add your voice to the mix. No reason you shouldn't be part of it. <laughs> he agreed, laughing. The other young man came hopping out of the shadows, eyes a little too wide, and turned out to be a cable news addict like myself. He too had not understood that he could not simply vote online but boy, was he into politics. Trump, he said, when are they gonna indict that guy? Are they going to, huh? 
Just because he's a rich man, they will let him get away. And other people are poor and they get charged. So what are they going to charge him? Are they going to let him run for president again? They're going to let him be president? I agreed that the situation was outrageous. And I told him that someone as into the news as he was really should not skip another election. Oh, I'm into the news, he said. I watch it all. Fox, CNN, MSNBC. And then he mentioned a local affiliate and their report of a murder on Camelback Road, which is a local road. They dismembered the body, he said, his eyes shining and widening. They found the, the, the decapitated head separate from the other parts. I told my mom, look, look. I began to wonder if he'd been the culprit. But I dismissed this far-fetched notion and encouraged him, too, to add his voice to the mix and vote next time. That's when I met mom in flip-flops. It turned out her standard, yeah, I'm registered, but I don't think I'll vote because I'm not into politics response, had to do with being conflicted. Her sister was big into politics, MAGA, Carrie Lake politics and had given her a list of everything she needed to go vote for. But she had not. The big meat was abortion. Her dad, too, said that abortion needed to be outlawed. Yeah, I know it's important. My sister keeps telling me politics is important. That's the only thing your sister and I agree on, I told her. And I asked her, keeping my language vague with an earshot of all the little kids, what her feelings were about forcing raped children to give birth and about doing zero about extreme weather, droughts, wildfires, et cetera. Um, and also Phoenix is running out of water, so they're pretty aware of that stuff. I fingered my crucifix necklace and asked how a person of faith could balance the Pope's teachings about climate and poverty with his traditional Catholic view of abortion. She engaged me. She was not so sure she was for all of that outlawing. She'd not given it too much thought, but she took my point. Bill came and got me. The polls were closing in 10 minutes, and we'd been asked to go and check that the lines were honored up until the final minute. We said goodbye. Just think about it. Decide what you think, and then vote, I said. She nodded as the kids swarmed the snack buggy taking turns to jump in the cab and sound the old-fashioned bulb horn. It was now officially nightfall. The full moon had risen. Bill would forego the big party in the hotel downtown and instead opt to drive me to a Denny's in North Phoenix where I'd catch my Amtrak shuttle bus back to the Maricopa train station. He'd insist on buying me my cup of tea because I'd come out and volunteered in his town when friends and neighbors, in his opinion, had not done enough. We'd meet the high cheekboned, thick mustached James Dean if he were 70 and Latino former truck driver, Leo, at the bus stop, dark, dark bomber jacket, lean body, jeans and belt from Bakersfield and his housewife grandmother companion returning from Flagstaff. They'd tell us of the reek of factory dairy farm and other toxins on the wind in Bakersfield too, as well as in Maricopa. Bill would keep checking the news and showing us the too close to call reports. He'd wait with us for the shuttle, even though it came 40 minutes late. And then with a hug and a hope we'll celebrate soon. Election Phoenix day is over. I'm on a shuttle driven by an immigrant Latina woman and my fellow passengers are a young black woman from my hometown of Oakland, a Somali guy from mom's town of Minneapolis and the two Bakersfielders represented shittily by Kevin McCarthy. In an hour, I'll board another Sunset Limited and complete my three week journey in Los Angeles. Last swing, Last whistle, no more stops. I'm going to miss it. This beautiful country and all of its places and peoples. All righty then. So um, 
Yay. So yeah, so we can uh, have a talk. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, you have the most beautiful poetry, I've got to say. <laughs> oh, thank you. But um, no, I mean, they're super fortunate to have you on. I've got to tell you, because you are so good at finding the humanity in people each time. And that I think that's the thing that's really hard. What happens is you get people who get so disparate in terms of overall political viewpoints to just start looking at people as human. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, a lot of it is just about, um, you know, knocking on doors of people who are pretending not to be home and, and leaving. This is, this was my bag that I acquired in the suburbs of Philadelphia, uh, which is like, which I would carry around on my shoulder with all the lit, you know? And I, so I, I this is like a little show and tell. This is like my Amtrak box <laughs> for my snacks that I reused. Um, anyway, so, but suffice it to say that most of it is about just putting this on people's doors. I would like handwrite little notes and Sharpies. Um, here's Erica White. She won. Um, yeah. So, um, so I just want to say that, you know, especially in this climate, it, people are scared to go and knock on doors or even sit at a table in front of a public place and register people to vote or something. But most of it is just boring. <laughs> it's not that scary. And, you know, a surprising number of Americans really want to talk. Particularly, I found people of uh, religious people who were conflicted and were actually eager to talk to me, I think because they wanted another point of view aside from their pastor. And interestingly, people who said they were personally opposed to abortion, but didn't believe in making other people have abortion, uh, not not be able to have abortions. And it's one Christian woman who told me, yeah, I'm against abortion, but I was raped. And when I was raped years ago, I thought if I'm pregnant, I'm going to have to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and so that woman was really, that was in Wisconsin and she was really happy here's my Wisconsin, um, really happy to have, have talked to me and, you know, really had a lot of questions. So you're doing a service and you get people who just became citizens who were like, how does this work? And you get them to register and, and really it's precinct by precinct and it really makes a huge difference. Um, yeah. It, it, if, if more people had done this, we would have won the, the control of the house. Um, and we might have more progressive candidates who were uh, representatives who were um, signing on right now to call for a ceasefire or, or questioning the idea of unlimited billions of dollars of funding to um, yeah. bomb children. Yeah. So please, there everyone, join in. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Please come on in. That's great. If you want to, you can always put them in the chat. That is an option. Um, I don't know. I think that it's just such a wonderful human thing to do. And I think people really require that personal connection because otherwise, you know, you're just seeing the whatever's on TV or you're seeing, you know, what the people who are closest to you are saying, and you're not getting a lot of interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing I was telling you before we, we officially started was just, you know, you, you hear all this sort of ad adversarial stuff on television and you, you, you deal with all these people as these states and regions as these abstract demographics. But then when you're in the actual place, looking at what the sky looks like and the, and the earth looks like and the architecture and the homes and the people, all the different people, that's the America. That's this like insane experiment, this vast place of people, all these different peoples, all these different regions. And, and that's what America is. And when you really experience that, um, and of course I'm privileged in, in the sense that I'm, you know, blonde hair and blue eyed and white so that I can experience that without as much terror as, as many people can't. Um, and, and, but when you do experience that, you know, just the huge swath of America from Philadelphia to Phoenix, um, it's really quite, it's really quite different from this sort of abstract 
you know, arguing like sports team kind of approach that you see a lot on the news. And, yeah. and it gets you out of the hell of just feeling helpless as you watch the news and into like, let me get down here on the ground and talk to my fellow citizens. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And so one thing I'm going to be doing is doing, I'm going to probably be reading this whole entire serial. Yes. Um, and performing, reading it. And thank you, Sarah. That's lovely. Oh, uh, you want to read that so that. Yeah. She's saying that Heather, these stories are so beautiful. Thank you for your generosity in doing this and sharing about it so beautifully. Well, thank you, Sarah, for, for writing that and, and for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be doing that and partly I'll, I'll probably be doing it to try to raise consciousness and raise um, morale and, and raise money even. I may do it in fundraising situations maybe throw in a singer songwriter or two to make it fun um, and do like weekly uh, readings, performances of the whole serial as a way of just kind of getting people revved up for 2024 and encouraging people to do this. Um, yeah. You know, no, I think it's such a great way to do it. Right. Yeah. And all, yeah. And we're organizing my friend Aileen from, <laughs> from uh, Bay Ridge born and raised who I met in the Max Rose campaign um, she and I have already decided we're going back to, we're going to Wisconsin together because Wisconsin is really key. Yes. The democracy really will sink or swim on Wisconsin. So we're going to go. So if you want to come <laughs> and then we, we might have a little as a, as a reward, we might watch the elections at this amazing cabin that my brother and I stayed in on Woodlake, Wisconsin, the home of my mother's soul. So, oh. That would be um, a, a special way to watch the elections. That'd be super neat. If anyone has any suggestions for Heather about where she should share with all this information with, I mean, who might be interested in doing a reading, please, please bring it along. Because I can think of definitely certain little political ones. So, you know, uh I'm drawing a blank right now, but there are a bunch of different ones that are trying to devote to um, um, grassroots Democrats. There's a few other ones that would be specific to that. But I, I think uh, different causes, like what about three, uh, 350? 350.org? Yeah, I, I used to be an active member of 350. I mean, you know, I'm thinking that it might be people you know, people that uh, do fundraisers in their homes who might want to, you know, sort of progressive politics doyens who might want to open their home up for, you know, for me to come and do a few and then hand me off to somebody else. So it could be like that. Or it could just be a cool cafe bar where there's, you know, some room where people actually would focus on someone reading. It's, you know, each one, as you can see, is just about a half hour or less. Um, and then, like I said, if, if we, if there's appetite for it, we could throw in a, a singer songwriter or a juggler <laughs> or something. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Well, you know, probably know enough people to do that. <laughs> or it could also be part of a, of a mm. helping people get ready, train them for canvassing. And this could be the entertainment part. That would be great. Conferences, you know, net, you know, conferences that people have in progressive politics and, and the Democratic Party, you know, where they want to, you know, want to have other than a lot of breakout groups and wonky conversations, they might want to actually have something slightly entertaining. So, <laughs> oh, that, no, that would actually be so, really great. I Mark Kelly. Mark Kelly t-shirt, because I met him that morning in Phoenix at the headquarters. So I got to shake the hand of a man who's been in outer space. Anyway. That is awesome. Wow. No, I mean, do you feel like you want to tour with this or do you feel like you want to? Well, I did have the thought that it would be really fun to, to, to do it here in LA and then cross the country backwards and do it in all the places that I. That'd be so neat. And finish it off in New York at the, you know, in Bay Ridge where they, no, actually. That could be really fun. I Have you kept in touch with the people that you were um, canvassing with? 
Uh, no, I haven't really, but I, I have their I have their contact information of my hosts and stuff. Yeah, it'd be sure worth checking out and reaching out to them because that'd be kind of a fun way to go. It'd be a fun way to finish it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where oh, I that'd be end, neat. Up, end where I started. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, like just retour the country, just just <laughs> in the opposite direction. Well, I mean, and you know, I mean, obviously, I might want to uh, uh, embed embed myself in maybe just in Wisconsin. I don't know. I mean, there's just right now, all the swing states are in play. So it's very, uh, and obviously, I mean, I I probably arguably would have done more good just staying in one place doing one thing. Bye, Stephanie. But, um, Bye. but the point being that um, uh, I figured I was going across the country anyway, and this would be a way to make it exciting for myself and also for other people. And yeah, a lot of people enjoyed reading it because they were watching the news and they were pulling their hair out. So it was like a sort of encouraging thing for people to re to read as I did it. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was one of the things I really enjoyed about it when you were doing it. It's like that this is it really does humanize the entire experience because I think people do get very much caught up into that sports team kind of mentality, and and it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to get caught up in that yeah but it's and, the what, well, what are we doing to humanize this right yeah. and 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 it's not a thing where you watch professional athletes who play much better than you you know yeah play, play it out no it's our game it's our participation that matters you know and we make all the difference you know be, if, if you're out there with 200 people and you knock on hundreds of doors and you get one person one person who answers the door whose mind you change or who simply goes oh i didn't realize oh oh i didn't know where the oh, okay i'll go and you get that one that's per precinct if there's 200 people of you doing that that's 200 votes per precinct enough to win it would if everybody had gone and done that in colorado or not everybody just 10 of us if 10 more of us had been in colorado Lauren Bobert would no longer be uh, in the would House of Representatives. It would be Adam Frisch, right this very moment. That's how few votes he lost by. That, wow. that just the four of us here right now and one of our friends each could have changed the course of that election. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it really can. And I, I think it's interesting because I've been seeing that in upstate New York. A lot of people are like, oh, well, it didn't really matter. It's like, well, you think it doesn't matter. Think who's stepping in. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. And, and yeah. Right. And Long Island and uh, New York. Yeah. New York basically lost us the house. If if New York had been had been a blue wave, we would have held the house. Yeah. Well, and that, that sometimes. <sighs> people like to not be taken in for granted. <laughs> I think that's another thing that people yeah. don't necessarily recognize. Like they want to be acknowledged, like, okay, let's, you know, come on in. This, it just means the difference between somebody turning up or not. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. I felt like uh, in Brooklyn, um, uh, uh, there were a lot of, um, uh, Arab and Muslim people that I talked to who were pretty darn pro-democratic or young people who didn't know a lot. They were, you know, the first per person in their family to be American citizens. And they yeah. were very enthusiastic once I told them. And I was campaigning for Max Rose, who's Jewish and a, and a war vet from Iraq. So, you know, um, and I felt like that, that whole, dem that whole demographic of the, you know, quite a number of tens of thousands, if not hundred thousands of Arab and Muslim people who live in that area of Brooklyn um, could have could have swung the election in favor of the Democrats. And yeah. that area did just elect a councilman who's Democratic. But now I feel like who knows, because- It's gonna be really tricky, but I also think again, if it, we start talking to uh, as human beings and also start talking about this experience as human beings, like what, that's one of the conversations I've been having to have with a bunch of people. And it's like, okay, let's let's look at this. What would you what would it be like if your family 
was going through this on either on any of the sides what what would they make that that immediate yes yeah instead and sometimes then that's when we have better conversations i love what mimi just said that you're incredibly brave to get on a train and actually circulate with all these unknown people looking in the eyes of possible maga person and talking to him or her that is guts bravo yeah. well thank you but you know I, it's we really should do more of it <laughs> um, yeah i think it's so super important it it's yeah it's really not um I mean, you know, we're all human beings, you know, um, and and uh, I I think in other situations in history when fascism was on the rise, um, there probably were people behaving more adversarially and, you know, villainizing those on the wrong side of their ideology and i think what it really takes is more to yeah like you just said have human to human conversations one of the things i would say is i'm out here because when i was 12 years old my best friend got pregnant because her uncle was raping her and now my best friend mona would have to have get be forced to give birth in 38 of our states so I'm out here to fight for those children. If you think that's okay, if that's what you're for, you know, then do nothing or vote for the other side. But if you don't think that's okay, then come out here. I mean, don't we need to defend those least among us who can't, who, who, who have so few rights to begin with, who are already being molested and raped and, and whatever's going on in their lives. I mean, we just can't, force them to give birth it's and that's what's going on legally that's what's going on yeah the population of, of of the united states of america we've had our basic civil rights taken away from us and if that doesn't get us out of our seats i don't know what will yeah and that that's actually super crucial to to point out i i know we were talking about that before that and the book banning it's like no but you can't forcing people to not learn what actually happens in history is not only a classic fascist move, but no, that is not acceptable. If you're needing to deny it that hard, first off, what is wrong <laughs> with your viewpoint? But second off, that we need more and better education. Yes, we do. We need more and more inclusive education, not to deny more people and yeah. that's you know whatever else you believe in that that is super crucial yeah. okay basic body autonomy basic knowledge and just and, and then just base ba really basically we need to pay teachers more yes um, and, oh. and Amy is saying to add to what you're saying about abortion not being considered part of the pursuit of life and liberty. The states with the most egregious abortion laws have no services for people. Yeah. Very little public assistance in those states. Exactly. Exactly. No, exactly. There, there, there's, there's, you know, a paucity of just basic medical care. And, and also the school teachers, to Laura's point, get paid, you know, Bupkis. $20,000 a <laughs> year. I mean, they get paid so very little and you know so and i and i think the average american can relate to that i think what happens is people don't you know there's no longer the local newspaper when when the yeah, so much of it first elected i said everybody should buy a subscription to the local paper of the person that they know who voted for the monster and i think that that would have done more if everybody reads their local news and they know like, oh yeah, they're talking about how they're repaving the street in front of the school. Oh yeah, I saw how they were doing that. Oh, so they know that their local news is actually reporting their reality that they experience in their town. And then when the reporters tell them about, you know, children being separated from their families, then they're more likely to believe that because, because they're invested in their own lives. And so what I think happens is that there's a lot of this, you know, just the more flashy personality, just it turning into extreme wrestling. It's just a sport 
But when you get right down to it and you ask people, oh, so are you against unions? You, so you don't think the UAW should have gotten a 25% raise. You think they should have just stayed, no raise, and then all the money should have gone to the, to the car companies, right? Oh, oh, really? So then why are you voting for the other side? Yeah, why are you voting for somebody who's going to deny you the right for oh, a living wage? Biden who stood in the picket, picket line with them? Okay. Um, you know, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, although right now I'm really, really angry at, I, I think it, this is a little hard to even talk about because I, you know, but I want to also say, go to Jewish Voice for Peace. They have a whole list of the 18 Congress persons who um, voted for the resolution for a ceasefire. So, and they're going to need support because they're going to get attacked by million dollar campaigns to get them unseated. So if there are, if you want to support Democrats who uh, think that, that God loves all children equally, then um, they're out there and that we should be funding peace. Yeah. Not revenge. Um, there are uh, Democratic and progressive politicians out there. There aren't any, <laughs> there aren't any Republicans that I know of. <laughs> yeah, and it's important for us to actually talk about it. I, one of the biggest things is like, we should be able, no matter what your sides are, to criticize your government, a government. The government it should not be inviolable, you know, that it's essential that we be able to question authority. And that means sometimes you're not going to like the people you've got in charge. So it's the question of, okay, get more involved locally. Like yeah. all the local stuff is where all the stuff that actually affects you matters. And then you can also start saying, okay, well, maybe it's affecting me. Maybe the, the national is too. You just deny yourself a vote every four years, you're not doing anything. I'm not saying it's easy or that it's going to fix everything or that things aren't necessarily rigged and crappy. <laughs> but going for people who absolutely are going to take everything away from you, maybe not your best choice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I am super proud of you and you are amazing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> It's just a train ride. Well, <laughs> it's a good train ride. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah and Mimi and um, Stephanie, when you come and watch. Yep. And everybody else, when they come and watch the recording. <laughs>